According to the 9-11 Commission, the airplane that appeared over Washington and went on to strike the Pentagon was Flight American 77, the same plane that had disappeared from radar screens over West Virginia almost one hour before. But they never provided any evidence of that. As we have seen, the flight data recorder's serial number that could have identified the airplane was never released. All the debunkers have to show for Flight 77 is a small piece of wreckage carrying an American Airlines serial number. But this piece could have been placed by anyone onto the grass after the impact. In fact, unidentified men in suits were seen meddling with the debris right after the impact in direct violation of the rules of a crime scene. A contractor who was only 100 yards away from the point of impact stated, it was DPS, the guys in the black coats. They were here right then and there. That's what I don't understand. Where did they come from? Maybe they knew something. I don't know. The debunkers claim that the witnesses' accounts are more than sufficient to identify the airplanes. Hundreds of people saw an American Airlines jet fly into that building. But it's presumable that if anyone wanted a different airplane to look like an American Airlines aircraft, they would have at least thought of painting the fuselage with the same colors. The majority of witnesses recall seeing a large airliner, but there are also witnesses who describe a much smaller, executive-like airplane. I was just casually looking out the corner, out, out of the window, and in the corner of my eye I saw what looked to be um, maybe a 20-passenger corporate jet, no markings on the side. Uh, from my office, I was able to see um, a white jet, like a Gulfstream-type commuter jet, I, I guess. Omar, you say this was a smaller plane, uh, 10 to 15 passengers, maybe? No, it's muy grande. No, it's muy grande. Is it not like too big? It's just. Ah, need. Tú sabes los aviones comerciales. I say like it like uh, business. Uh, like a business jet. Yeah. It looked like a commuter plane, two engines come down from the south, real low, uh, proceed right on and crash right into the uh, Pentagon. And are you fairly sure that it was what we sometimes describe and recognize as a yes, small commuter plane? Uh, yes, it was. By the witnesses' accounts alone, it's impossible to establish what kind of airplane it was. As the plane clipped five light poles before striking the Pentagon, the debunkers maintain that the distance between the light poles indicates a corridor wide enough that only a large airliner could have created it. Ce qu'on peut voir justement, c'est que l'avion en arrivant a tombé cinq pylônes qui étaient sur son sur sa trajectoire, et ces ces pylônes étaient espacés de 25 mètres. Troviamo alcuni lampioni abbattuti, cinque lampioni. Tutti insieme fanno una fascia larga 26 metri. Facciamo finta di ipotizzare che non sappiamo che si tratti di un aereo. Sappiamo che c'è qualche cosa largo 26 metri che è passato di lì. 26 meters is roughly 85 feet, but the wingspan of a 757 is 124 feet, which means any airplane with an 85 foot wingspan could have downed those light poles. It didn't need to be a 757. In fact, with a 100-ton airliner hitting a reinforced concrete building like the Pentagon, one would expect to find a situation similar to this. What immediately stood out instead was the absence of large, identifiable pieces of debris which are usually found after the crash of an airliner. Bob Pugh was the first Maybe professional cinematographer to arrive on site. Uh, no one was in control of the area. Um, I had free reign. Um, and there's a lot of debris in the foreground of those videos. Again, it's very small pieces. I mean, I'm standing on pieces, a dinner plate or smaller in size. All the while, I'm looking for wreckage, um, and I can't find a piece of anything that I recognize. I can't see the tail. I can't see the wheels. I can't see the engines. There's no chairs. There's no luggage. According to the debunkers, there are no large pieces of debris on the lawn because most of the airplane ended up inside the building. Quindi, gran parte dei frammenti dell'aereo non sono fuori perché l'aereo è entrato nell'edificio. Purdue University has produced a detailed computer animation illustrating the official version of the event. We had the plans for the Pentagon, all the details, right down to the last reinforcing bar. Uh, the speed of the airplane and the direction from which came was given to us by the uh, Transport Safety Institute. According to the official version, the plane approached in a low trajectory, clipping five light poles from the nearby intersection. Slightly tilted to the left, it hit a trailer parked outside the building with the bottom of the right wing, and then impacted the facade at an angle of 42 degrees. Most of the plane penetrated the facade and proceeded inside the building on a diagonal course, causing destruction as it was being destroyed. The fuselage pierced through the outer wall of the C-ring, 
producing this round-shaped exit hole 10 to 12 feet wide. There are, however, many problems with this version of the events. The first one is the actual wingspan of a Boeing 757. Most of us remember the facade of the Pentagon after it had collapsed. But before it collapsed, right after the impact, this is what the building looked like. This series of pictures was taken by a Navy photographer shortly after the impact. There doesn't seem to be enough damage for a Boeing 757 to have penetrated the building almost in full. Using the best part from each image, a digital expert has created this composite picture, which has become the universal tool of reference for anyone involved in the debate. The composite picture shows an almost continuous opening at ground level, about 90 feet wide. The damage extends to the second floor, with an entry hole about 15 feet wide. This is enough, maintain the debunkers, to have accommodated most of the plane inside the building. Effectivement, on peut se demander où est-il passé. Et puis, si on prend des photos qui ont été prises à des instants différents et qui justement, par un assemblage, ont permis de montrer les dégâts qui étaient réellement euh, visibles sur la façade, et là, on voit clairement que tout, tout le rez-de-chaussée a été euh, anéanti sur, sur une longueur de 30 mètres. Mm. Et puis, euh, au milieu, bien sûr, vous avez le trou de la carlingue. Mm. That gash in the E-ring was about 90 feet across. The, um, the wingspan of the plane was about 124 and change. That punched the hole into the building. It is true, the wingspan of a 757 is 124 feet. But the debunkers forget that the plane came in at a 42 degree angle, which makes the projected wingspan on the facade 160 feet wide. That's almost twice the 90 foot existing gash. As shown in this animation, the left wing should have also destroyed these two windows to the left of the opening. But the whole segment to the left of the opening doesn't seem to have been hit by a wing traveling at 500 miles per hour. The window's wooden frames are still in place, and the glass seems to have been broken from the ensuing explosion, not from the impact itself. The limestone covering the facade has fallen off, but the bricks underneath appear practically untouched. By the same projected angle, the right wing should have impacted the facade all the way to this column on the second floor. In fact, there is a diagonal cut on the second floor wall that could have resulted from the wing's impact. But this puts most of the wing above the second floor slab, which means it never penetrated the facade to begin with. So where did it go? This is the explanation by popular mechanics for what happened to the wings. The wings did not fully penetrate the facade. In fact, the wings had already been partially sheared off by the time the plane even hit the building. The fuselage mainly made the hole that existed. Conspiracy theorists want to know why it wasn't the width of the full wingspan of the plane, and actually just the simple reason was that the wings came off. But where did they go? Popular mechanics doesn't say. A similar problem is posed by the horizontal stabilizers, which extend some 50 feet in width. As they are mounted three feet higher than the wings, they should have impacted the facade approximately here and here. But there are no visible marks from their impact on the facade, nor is any recognizable piece of the stabilizers visible on the lawn. Same story for the tail, which raises 24 feet above the fuselage. At the time of impact, the tail should have hit as high as the windows on the fourth floor. The Purdue animation shows the tail entering the building in full, as if it were cutting through butter. But the facade above the entry hole doesn't show any significant damage, and the glass from the windows around the hole isn't even broken. For the missing tail and stabilizers, Popular Mechanics offers this generic explanation. A uh, plane flying 500 miles an hour, hitting a concrete wall that is extremely reinforced, there's not going to be much left of it. You're not going to see it sitting on the lawn of the Pentagon in one or two or three pieces. But here is the problem. If part of the wings, the stabilizers, and the tail disintegrated against the facade, how could the fuselage penetrate it almost entirely? The fuselage is by far the weakest part of the plane, as it basically consists of an empty cylinder meant to carry the passengers and their belongings. How fragile the fuselage is, compared to the wings, is explained by aviation expert Jacques Roland. Jacques Roland, ancien général de l'armée de l'air, est aujourd'hui le meilleur expert en crash aérien auprès des tribunaux. Il n'est pas du tout évident de comprendre qu'effectivement, dès que vous avez un choc à l'avant, l'ensemble s'enfonce à la vitesse de pénétration, en fait. Et le premier point dur se trouve ici. Tant que vous n'arrivez pas là, euh, l'avion, euh, c'est du papier. Question. 
How could the fuselage, which is the weakest part of the plane, penetrate the facade almost entirely, while part of the wings, the stabilizers, and the tail, which are relatively stronger, were unable to do so and were shattered in a thousand pieces instead? Even more mysterious is the disappearance of the engines. The 757 that allegedly hit the Pentagon was equipped with two RB211 engines built by Rolls-Royce. Almost eight feet in height, weighing over 7,000 pounds each, the internal core of the engine is made with components so sturdy and resistant that they are considered practically indestructible. It has to rotate at about 10,000 revolutions per minute, a blade speed of about 800 miles per hour. To operate at around 1,700 degrees, they're designed not to melt. Quali sono le parti che non vengono distrutte, che non si squagliano per il calore? I pezzi del carrello e il, e il cuore dei due motori, che è molto più compatto dalla parte esterna dei motori, ovviamente è fatto in materiali eh, che devono resistere alla temperatura, 2000-2500 gradi, per cui la parte centrale dei due motori è sicuramente sopravvissuta all'impatto. But where are they? In their animation, Purdue University has chosen to ignore the issue. As one can see, moments before the impact, the two engines simply vanish into thin air. Debunker Paolo Attivissimo has made what he calls a cautious suggestion. This is a motor, Rolls-Royce RB211. This is an object found in the Pentagon. When I said earlier, probably the motors are not completely entered. This object is in a compatible form. I'm prudent, I say simply that it's in a form compatible. But this rotor could have come from any engine. There is also another picture of a similar disc, or possibly the same disc, from a different angle. And then there is this part of an engine found inside the Pentagon. But we are not looking for scraps. We are looking for two three-ton pieces of machinery made with steel and titanium that after an accident should look something like this. Or like this. Or like this. In fact, had the Pentagon been hit by a 757, the two engines would have impacted the facade around these two points, just below the wings. This means they would have proceeded inside the building on a path somewhat parallel to the fuselage, carving a trail of destruction much more devastating than any other part of the plane. È un proiettile simile al motore? Sì, sì, sicuramente sì. Può essere tranquillamente un proiettile. Lanciato quello a 800 km all'ora, la struttura viaggia. But there are no engines visible outside the exit hole, nor are there any other holes in the wall that could have been caused by an engine. Question. Can you explain what happened to the core of the two engines, which is built with components so strong and resistant to be considered practically indestructible? Now for the biggest mystery of all, the exit hole. According to the official version, it was the fuselage of the plane that created this hole in the wall of the sea ring. On September 15, 2001, the Pentagon renovation manager stated, the plane penetrated through the E-ring, D-ring, C-ring. The nose of the plane just barely broke through the inside of the C-ring, so it was extending into AE drive a little bit. The AE drive is the internal alley separating the C-ring from the B-ring. But how could the fuselage have made it all the way through the wall of the sea ring? Un aereo che pesa 120 tonnellate, lanciato 800 km l'ora, impatta una facciata, la trapassa. Nel trapassarla viene tritato dalle colonne che ci sono in mezzo, a modo di grattugia, se volete mi passate questo termine, e alla fine quel che rimane sono solo frammenti molto piccoli. Quel poco che rimane in fondo arriva dall'altra parte. If the fuselage is only a cylinder and it gets cut and ground by the columns in a thousand pieces, how can it retain the circular shape needed to punch this almost perfectly round hole in the wall? This is where the explanations by the debunkers become absolutely fascinating. The mass of the plane penetrated the building with enormous energy and continued into the building in a state almost more like a liquid than a solid. Then encountered reinforced concrete columns two feet thick so the aircraft was flying through a forest of columns. The plane became almost like an artillery shell or a tank round. What actually came out it was a circular ball of fire, which is how fire goes when it moves. That's why it has a perfectly round shape. By this time, there was an avalanche of debris that was moving as a single mass, much as in an avalanche of snow. Whether it was a liquid mass, a ball of fire, or an avalanche of snow, all these hypotheses are flatly contradicted by the Pentagon Building Performance Report, a document published in 2003 by the American Society of Civil Engineers. 
In assessing the condition of the columns on the first floor, the report reads, Columns 3G, 3H, 3J, and 5J were damaged but still standing, although in the direct path of the fuselage. It is highly unlikely that any significant portion of the fuselage could have retained structural integrity at this point in its travel. The aircraft frame most certainly was destroyed before it had traveled a distance that approximately equaled the length of the aircraft. The length of the aircraft is 155 feet, which is roughly half the distance between the entry and the exit holes. That no substantial part of the fuselage reached the wall of the C-ring was also confirmed by the first eyewitnesses who described the damage inside the Pentagon. So the plane went in up to the E, D, and to the C-ring. Not all the way through the C-ring. Question. Given that, according to the Pentagon Building Performance Report, the aircraft frame most certainly was destroyed before it had traveled a distance that approximately equaled the length of the aircraft, and that it is highly unlikely that any significant portion of the fuselage could have retained structural integrity from that point on, can you explain what caused the almost perfectly round exit hole in the outer wall of the C-ring? In conclusion, we have an opening on the first floor that's a bit more than half the projected wingspan of a 757. The tip of the left wing and most of the right wing missing without a valid explanation. The horizontal stabilizers and the tail also missing without a valid explanation. A fuselage that behaved more like a warhead than an empty cylinder made with aluminum. No trace whatsoever of the core of the two engines and an exit hole on the C-ring that no one can rationally explain. Given all these facts, we must conclude that the damage observed at the Pentagon is not compatible with and must have been created by something other than a Boeing 757. The mystery of what hit the Pentagon could have been easily solved if the FBI had released the videos from dozens of surveillance cameras that are placed all around the impact zone. Yeah, there were a lot of cameras around the Pentagon. If you look at the Pentagon, you can see that there's cameras on each corner. There's cameras at some of the businesses around the Pentagon. And we know in those cases, the tapes were confiscated immediately by the FBI within hours of the event. When a Freedom of Information Act requesting all the videos covering the impact zone was filed, the FBI agent in charge of the tapes responded, the FBI possessed 85 videotapes that might be potentially responsive to plaintiff's FOIA request. But, concluded the agent, I determined that only one videotape showed the impact of Flight 77 into the Pentagon on September 11, 2001. This is the tape we have all seen many, many times. The FBI could have released all the videos anyway, just to allow the public to see by themselves what was actually shown in each of them. But for some reason, they preferred to keep them under wraps. I've uh, filmed before down at the Pentagon, before 9-11. There's got to be at least 100 video cameras ringing that building, in the trees, everywhere. They've got that plane coming in in a, at a, with 100 angles. I want to see the video. I want to see 100 videos that exist of this. Why don't they want us to see that plane coming into the building? Not only has this question never been answered, but an in-depth analysis of the only footage of the impact ever released contains a dramatic surprise. Initially, the DOD released these five frames taken from a Pentagon parking security camera. Later on, in 2006, the DOD released the entire sequence from which the five frames had been extracted. The time-lapse sequence runs at approximately one frame per second, and it shows the moments leading up to the impact, the large explosion, and the billowing fire that ensued. Unfortunately, the video does not show the airplane in transit. All we can see in the frame preceding the explosion is what appears to be the tail of an airplane followed by a trail of white smoke. But the body of the plane remains covered by this concrete column standing in the foreground. The Department of Defense also released a second video taken by a different camera from the same parking lot. The second camera was actually located in the very column that obscured the view of the plane in the first video. This aerial shot of the Pentagon shows the actual location of the two cameras. The second camera faces in the same direction as the first, and it offers a clear, unobstructed view of the same field of action. By using the moment of the explosion, we can synchronize the two cameras with absolute frame-by-frame -frame accuracy. By synchronizing the two cameras, we notice that the second video begins earlier than the first, while the first lasts longer than the second. 
This leaves us with a middle common section of about 100 frames, which are perfectly synchronized with each other. From the moment the police car moves on, the action proceeds in an identical manner both in the frames preceding the explosion and in those following the explosion. Especially in the second part of the videos, after the explosion, we can verify how each couple of frames depicts exactly the same action by looking at the shape of the billowing smoke. This confirms that the two cameras were operating in perfect synchronization. This is only to be expected. After all, the two cameras were controlled by a centralized recording system called Multiplexer, or TLR. There is, however, one pair of frames from the two videos that shows a completely different action from one another. They happen to be the two frames in which the plane travels across the lawn. It's frame 23 in the relative count. As the first video showed the tail and the trail of smoke, we would expect the second camera placed in this concrete column to show the entire body of the plane in the same position. It does not. In the corresponding frame, camera two shows only the tip of the plane entering frame from the right-hand corner. But how can the nose of the plane be behind the tail at the same moment in time? The synchronization system allows for a maximum fluctuation between the two cameras, or margin of error, of 1 30th of a second. Given that the plane is traveling at 750 feet per second, the maximum possible fluctuation between the two cameras would translate into a difference of a mere 25 feet in the position of the plane. A 757 is 155 feet long. Even calculating the perspective due to the diagonal path, this is far from sufficient to explain the large discrepancy between the two images. Furthermore, after this moment, the two videos resume their perfect synchronization, which is maintained all the way to the end. Why these two crucial frames, and only these two, are so different from one another has puzzled researchers and digital experts alike. The same digital expert who had prepared the universal image from the Pentagon has also conducted an in-depth technical analysis of the two videos released by the Department of Defense. After confirming that the two cameras were synchronized by the same multiplexer system, this expert has compiled a table comparing the contents of each pair of frames. As one can see, Frame 23 is the only one showing a strong inconsistency between the two images. The expert has then proceeded to analyze the two frames with the most sophisticated digital tools and has obtained some astonishing results. A series of Boolean subtractions reveals that a small part of the image is actually present in both frames. What is said to be the nose of the airplane in camera 2 is also present as part of the smoke trail in camera 1. It seems in fact as if someone has retouched this area of the frame by means of cut and paste in order to cover the plane, while he has kept the end of the smoke trail to make it look like the nose of the plane entering frame. Question. Given that the maximum fluctuation between the two cameras would translate in a difference of 25 feet in the position of the plane, can you provide a valid explanation for the large discrepancy between the two corresponding frames? Absent a valid explanation for this discrepancy, we must conclude that at least one of the two frames is the result of intentional manipulation or photoshopping. If we now summarize the situation at the Pentagon, we have the total lack of evidence that the unknown incoming was in fact Flight 77, a mysterious phantom plane that attracted the attention in the opposite direction, the failure from the White House to shoot down the incoming even though it posed a serious and imminent threat, a totally illogical approach maneuver from a terrorist's point of view, an alleged hijacker incapable of performing that maneuver, the absence of any significant part of the plane from the wreckage, a damage to the building clearly incompatible with a 757, a doctored tape of the impact, and the obvious reluctance by the FBI to release any other tape that could allow the identification of the plane.